Hey. Hey. So I think we can start. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Philip Lankans. I work for the Ethereum MIST team. And today, I'm very excited to give an update on, on MIST and the new direction that we're heading. Um, but before we get to the exciting part, I want to talk a little bit about the things that didn't work and that we don't want to do anymore. Uh, maybe some of you went to DEF CON and remember the, the didn't work song. So this is the MIST team's best of didn't work. Um, building a browser with Electron in 2018 was a bad idea. Um, the, the Electron framework is getting better and better, but you should not build a browser with it. Um, and we stopped doing this. Building our own Electron alternative um, was a good idea, but it took away too many of the resources that we, that we needed for the actual uh, application. Um, Google entered the field. Um, the Electron framework got new developers from Microsoft. Uh, they are really interested to keep VS Code, the VS Code success going on. So there's a lot of stuff happening, and it made no sense for us anymore to build our own solution. Uh, 2018 was a really bad year for NPM module security. Maybe some of you remember the event stream attacks on crypto wallets. But Removing most of the NPM modules from the privileged context of the application without breaking the whole thing um, just doesn't work. Convincing users to run a full node was also with good intentions, um, but the, the kind of audience that uh, wanted to start with MIST was not prepared for this, and convincing all of them had a really negative impact on the user experience and usability and there were other solutions like MetaMask and Brave that did a much better job in like, onboarding these users. And we introduced layered nodes um, quite late, but we also realized that um, the way we did it was not, was not perfect and not very usable. Uh, eventually, we came to the realization that MIST was extremely helpful for many years, but we came to the point where we thought, OK, we need to change something more like radically and drastically. We need to completely rethink the product that we're building. And MIST cannot exist in its current form anymore. And I'm happy to introduce Ethereum Grid. Ethereum Grid is our take on like, completely rethinking the, the product and also the audience that we're building for. Uh, first of all, Grid, uh, comes from the, the name comes from Tron. Some of you probably know that we all really like, like Tron. The, the movie, of course, not, not the crypto Tron. And in the Tron universe, uh, the grid is often referred to as the digital frontier. The grid was made to provide an experimental platform where all forms of research could be carried out at par unparalleled speeds. And this, this re really resonated with us, and we thought it was a really good mission statement for what we wanted to build, so we adopted the name. And this is our version of the grid. So this is an early preview uh, of, of Ethereum grid our platform to carry out experiments and research at unparalleled speeds. It's a platform um, where you can manage all the clients, all these amazing tools that the community has built. So on the, on the left you see Geth, for example, and then Swarm, Clef, Trinity, Whisper, um, and there are more applications, but it's really hard if you enter this space. The landscape is quite complicated to get started, and it's also 
there's al always uh, a risk involved if you download something to your computer and you manage your private keys with it. And we wanted to make this a smooth experience and wanted to give back, the, uh, wanted to give back power to the users about what's happening on their computer. So you can run now tests. Uh, you can test different versions of clients against each other. You can run them and upgrade them and configure them all from one ap application. And then uh, we envision more, more ways to interact with the network and also with the client in more meaningful ways. So we want that you can use this tool also to send messages, send transactions, sign data or sign transactions, um, and then interact with tools like Remix, for example. If this is interesting for you, uh, I want to invite you to follow the progress on grid.ethereum.org. And if, the, if you can't wait, there's also on our GitHub repository, there are pre-built binaries that you can play with already. Um, you can engage in the discussions, you can file issues or contribute. Okay, so this was probably the, the biggest change for us, but we also changed our focus a little bit to, to different topics. And one is developer experience. So this is not only for us, but this is also for external contributors. Uh, we switched from Meteor to React. Um, this allowed faster development for us, less configuration. We could use Create React app with hot loading, uh, hot reloading, and everything worked out of the box. Um, easier maintenance, better testing. And we also did this step because we wanted to encourage people to, to get more involved and contribute. The client runs in the browser now. There's no complicated setup. You don't need to run a full node. You don't need to um, configure or run Electron. If you want to make UI tests, change the user interface a little bit, or just play with the components, this can all happen in the browser now. We completely redesigned the, the architecture for this. Um, the product is uh, Ethereum React Components. It's on GitHub already. It's more than 40 components. So we really took Mist apart, took everything that was valuable, refactored it in React and made it a component. Um, and it looks like this, so you can find components for accounts, wallet management, network, converter functions, um, components for transactions. And there's also a hosted storybook for you. So you can um, see all the components that are there already pre-rendered um, in the browser. You can play with different states for these components. You can see how they're used in source code. Uh, you can see the rendered version of them and yeah, just browse and, and explore these components and use them for your projects. So what's next for the component library? We want to create even more or we, we want to cover even more states for the components for UI testing. Um, we want to cover all network account and transaction states and make them available in the component library. Um, we want to use Material UI as a base design. We think the the user interface is a little bit dated, and we want to improve this. Um, and we are, we are already moving towards um, Material UI. And then we want to use it mostly for many internal projects. OK, another big, big item for us was updates uh, and release cycles. And we had some good improvements here. So we reduced most of our updates from roughly 50 megabytes to 2 megabytes. Um, we have staged rollouts now with alpha, beta, production, and dev channels. Um, we're changing the whole update strategy from few large and security critical updates to multi potentially multiple updates per day. And this is possible because we introduced different security zones. So we are updating the web application and then critical binaries independently of each other. And this was kind of a challenge for us. Our dependency model was really ugly, so pretty much like this slide. Um, you had different components there that were responsible for installing and upgrading other components, and then the, these are the, the, the gray arrows, the, the big, big gray arrows, and then the, the black arrows are direct dependencies, and then we had different security contexts, so you can see the, the red box there. This is like external, external node modules that were running in a security, security critical context, and th this was not only a few, and we tried to remove them completely. So Grid now has only one main dependency to a, a framework that is, that is built by us. And this is the App Manager. And the App Manager is a different, or another project that we built just for the dependency management. The App Manager is a core piece of Grid, and it's a unified update mechanism. It updates the user interface, the main application, the Electron framework binaries, and all the client binaries, 
all with one tool. It supports hot updating and loading, and I will talk about it in a second. And then if you ever downloaded, for example, the get binaries from the, from the release page and scrolled all the way down uh, to the bottom, you could find instructions how to verify the signatures of these binaries. And we thought that this was a complicated step, and we assumed that a lot of people would not do this. So we built it in. So the Electron App Manager now does all the signature, signature verification for you. This is, this is the hot loading mechanism in action. So it will go to GitHub, search for our release, and when it finds it, it will download it and run it. And then you have your application. And this is in real time. So it only takes a couple of seconds to install a new full version of the, of the software. Um, the cool thing is we don't need a dedicated web server or update server for this. Uh, arbitrary file protocols are sufficient. And this allows us, um, so the library is written in TypeScript and we have interfaces for the backends and we already have a GitHub and Azure backend and we're working on uh, AWS support. But also things like IPFS and Swarm are possible with it. Everything where you can just download a package, ideally with range requests like over HTTP. And then you're always on the latest version. And it's even more, you get these like, nice snapshots of these versions directly from our GitHub repository. And you can switch between these versions. Um, we have staged rollouts, we have release channels. And then we have rollbacks. If something is crashing, you just go back to a different version of the application. And you can even pin a version if you don't want to have upgrades. And there's even more. You can completely cache these packages. Uh, they are offline capable. Um, you don't need a service worker. They are more powerful than progressive web applications. Um, you don't need to write them to file system. You can completely run it in the renderer. In this case, the application is served from a virtual file system. Um, the packages support partial resource loading, so we can actually host the package somewhere. It doesn't, it, we, do, we don't really care where it's hosted, but we can peek into it and see if a certain resource is there, for example, an icon. And even better, we can load metadata and then do uh, integrity checks on the package before we even download it. Or we can do full signature checks. So we download the metadata, we make sure that it's a valid package before we even download something to your computer. And this thing, uh, so we, we will sign all our packages, and this is possible because of another project that we're working on, which is completely security focused. And it's called Ethereum Signed Packages. So it's best described as this. We want package signing. So which keys should we use for this? And we thought, what? I mean, we have already a bunch of private keys that we, that we need to manage. Why create more? Can we use our Ethereum keys to sign packages? And what effect would it have? And in practice, it looks like this. So you have your web app, your dApp. You can have source code or a smart contract. Then you put it in a container file like zip, ASR, tar, whatever. And then you use our CLI tool called ETH package. And you sign your package, and then you get this. You get another package. The size is unintentionally. It's, it's not getting bigger, really. It's just, it's just some small metadata changes. And this package is super cool because it's signed with Ethereum, first of all. But then during verification, you get a really nice property. So first of all, you get all the security, security features that you want from a signed package. You get authentication. You get integrity, non-repudiation. But then, if you do the verification, you don't only get a public key back, but now you get an Ethereum address back. And this allows for a complete new set of applications. And they can be des best described as decentralized app marketplaces. So usually, if you sign your, if you sign your code, first, the first step is to get the certificate. You can pay up to $1,500 a year to get the certificate. In our case, you can get, get paid to sign your modules. So we can completely incentivize developers to sign their modules now. But you can also just get paid for your open source work. And this can happen automatically, for example, and for example built into the package manager or the runtime. Um, so whenever there is a crypto payment for a paid app, a small chunk of it can go to all the packages that signed, uh, to all the package developer that signed their packages. Um, things like zero config donation buttons are possible. You don't have to sign up on any donation platform. We can just send the money to the address that, that signed the, the application or package. You can use existing hardware to sign, so you can use, reuse your USB um, hardware token. Or you can use the amazing tools that exist. And you can even sign the packages in the browser. And the best part is probably you can stay completely anonymous. 
or you manage your, your developer identity with all these cool emerging identity protocols and standards that are coming out now. And we did one example. Um, through, certifi through certificates uh, powered by GitHub. So if you go to our, um, to our grid repository, you will find a new, new kind of file here. It's called ETH certs. It's this, it's a markdown file. And you can use our ETH package um, command line tool to create a certificate for you, a self-signed certificate with your private keys. Um, you just paste you just pay, paste the output into this file, um, which is essentially a list of all the authors that have access to the GitHub repository. And then because Electron App Manager uses ETH package as a dependency, um, it can download this list of authors and then make sure that no other packages other than signed by any of the authors, authors are executed in the runtime. So what is the state for Ethereum signed packages? There's a magician's post, there's an EIP draft, there's a specification draft, there's a reference implementation for the browser and for Node. There's a CLI tool called ETH package that I uh, briefly showed. Um, and that's it pretty much. This is uh, like the, the work we've been doing. Um, it's a lot of new projects, a lot of changes. And for your convenience, I, I listed all the, the important links here. Thank you. Yeah, maybe you have some time for one or more question. Okay. Okay, so the target audience, we're, we're shifting the focus a little bit away from, from mainstream users and more to, to people that care about the ecosystem and about the tools and we want to provide them with the perfect environment to run tests and to develop applications. So this is more focused on an experienced audience and we think they are great tools for other, other audiences and they are already catered in a way and we don't need to do this. So we, we are shifting focus to, to this kind of, of group. And we also want, uh, we also, of course, we want to, to help um, the other projects. So it's, it's a little bit of a dog fooding strategy where we help, um, like, not to onboard users, but um, to help other clients to, to, to be a viable alternative. We don't want everyone to use Geth, for example. It's, we are building different clients on purpose so that we have a decentralization on, on, the, on the client layer and um, we don't want to centralize it there. So it's a good idea to, to allow users to be flexible in their configurations. Thank you.